Darby's Translation 1890 The Acts 27 But when it had been determined that we should sail to Italy, they delivered up Paul and certain other prisoners to a centurion, by name Julius, of Augustus' company. And going on board a ship of Adramidium about to navigate by the places along Asia, we set sail, Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day we arrived at Sidon. And Julius treated Paul kindly and suffered him to go to his friends and refresh himself. And setting sail thence we sailed under the lee of Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. And having sailed over the waters of Cilicia and Pamphylia we came to Myra in Lycia. And there the centurion having found a ship of Alexandria sailing to Italy, he made us go on board her. And sailing slowly for many days, and having with difficulty got abreast of Nidus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under the lee of Crete abreast of Samony, and coasting it with difficulty we came to a certain place called Fair Havens, near to which was the city of La Cie, La Cie. And much time having now been spent, and navigation being already dangerous, because the fast also was already passed, Paul counseled them, saying, Men, I perceive that the navigation will be with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion believed rather the helmsman and the shipowner than what was said by Paul. And the harbor being ill adapted to winter in, the most counseled to set sail thence, if perhaps they might reach Venus to winter in, a port of Crete looking northeast and southeast. And the south wind blowing gently, supposing that they had gained their object, having weighed anchor they sailed close in shore along Crete. But not long after there came down at a hurricane called Eurocliton. And the ship being caught and driven, and not able to bring her head to the wind, wind, letting her go we were driven before it. But running under the lee of a certain island called Clauda, we were with difficulty able to make ourselves masters of the boat, which having hoisted up, they used helps, frappaying the ship, and fearing lest they should run into Sirtis and run aground, and having lowered the gear they were so driven. But the storm being extremely violent on us, on the next day they threw cargo overboard, and on the third day with their own hands they cast away the ship furniture. And neither sun nor stars appearing for many days, and no small storm lying on us, in the end all hope of our being saved was taken away. And when they had been a long while without taking food, Paul then standing up in the midst of them said, Ye ought, O men, to have hearkened to me, and not have made sail from Crete and have gained this disaster and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good courage, for there shall be no loss at all of life of any of you, only of the ship. For an angel of the God, whose I am and whom I serve, stood by me this night, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must stand before Caesar, and behold, God is granted to thee all those that sail with thee. Wherefore be of good courage, men, for I believe God that thus it shall be, as it has been said to me. But we must be cast ashore on a certain island. And when the fourteenth night was come, we being driven about in Adria, towards the middle of the night the sailors supposed that some land neared them, and having sounded found twenty fathoms, and having gone a little farther and having again sounded they found fifteen fathoms, and fearing lest we should be cast on rocky places, casting four anchors out of the stern, they wished that day were come. But the sailors wishing to flee out of the ship, and having let down the boat into the sea under pretext of being about to carry out anchors from the prow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these abide in the ship ye cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the boat and let her fall. And while it was drawing on to daylight, Paul exhorted them all to partake of food, saying, Ye have passed the fourteenth day watching in expectation without taking food. Wherefore I exhort you to partake of food for this has to do with your safety, for not a hair from the head of any one of you shall perish. And, having said these things and taken a loaf, he gave thanks to God before all, and having broken it began to eat. And all taking courage, themselves also took food. And we were in the ship, all the souls, 276. And having satisfied themselves with food, they lightened the ship, casting out the wheat into the sea. And when it was day they did not recognize the land, but they perceived a certain bay having a strand, on which they were minded, if they should be able, to run the ship ashore, and, having cast off the anchors, they left them in the sea, at the same time loosening the lashings of the rudders, and hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the strand. And falling into a place where two seas met they ran the ship aground, and the prow having stuck itself fast remained unmoved, but the stern was broken by the force of the waves. waves. And the counsel of the soldiers was that they should kill the prisoners, lest anyone should swim off and escape. But the centurion, desirous of saving Paul, hindered them of their purpose, and commanded those who were able to swim, casting themselves first into the sea, 
to get out on land, and the rest, some on boards, some on some of the things that came from the ship, and thus it came to pass that all got safe to land. Acts 27 By F. B. Hull While at Ephesus Paul had purposed in the Spirit saying, I must also see Rome, Acts 19 verse 21, and, what is more important still, it was the Lord's purpose for him, so must thou also bear witness at Rome, Acts 23 verse 11. We have just been tracing God's ways behind the scenes bringing to pass that it was determined that we should sail into Italy. Again Luke uses we, showing that he was now again a companion of Paul as they started on this journey, which was to be so full of disaster, and yet have so miraculous an ending. Looking at second causes, Paul might have bitterly regretted his appeal to Caesar, when Agrippa declared that but for it he might have been set at liberty. Looking to God, all was clear, and Paul with other prisoners started on the voyage. Yet though the journey was thus ordered of God, it did not follow that everything moved with ease and smoothness. The very opposite, for it is put on record from the beginning that the winds were contrary, verse 4. The fact that circumstances are against us is no proof that we are out of the way of God's will, nor do favoring circumstances necessarily mean that we are in the way of His will. We cannot safely deduce from circumstances what may or may not be His will for us. Circumstances continued contrary and progress was tedious, the wind not suffering us, verse 7, and the dangerous time of year arrived when it was customary to suspend voyages in some safe harbor. The place called Fair Havens was reached, which in spite of its name was not a suitable spot, and here a conflict of opinion developed. The skipper was desirous of reaching Fennis, while Paul counseled that they were about to run into disaster and loss, not only for ship and cargo but also to their lives. The Roman centurion, in charge of the party of prisoners, held the casting vote, and having listened to the voice of worldly wisdom and nautical skill on the one hand, and that of spiritual understanding on the other, he decided in favor of the advice of the skipper. Any ordinary person, without a doubt, would have decided as did the centurion and when suddenly the wind veered and blew gently from the south, it looked as though God was favoring the centurion's decision. decision. But again we see that circumstances furnish no true guidance, for they set sail only to be caught in the dreaded Europlighten, which upset all their plans. They proceeded by sight and not by faith, and all ended in disaster. They took all possible measures to work out their own salvation, but without effect, so that ultimately all hope was abandoned. It is easy to see that all this may be effectively used as a kind of allegory, representing the soul's struggles for deliverance, whether from the guilt or the power of sin. Nothing was right until God intervened, first by his word through Paul, and then by his power in the final shipwreck. It was when they were nearly starved and quite hopeless that the angel of God appeared to Paul. Nearly a fortnight had passed since the storm began, and until this point Paul had not had anything authoritative to say. But now the word of God had reached him, stating that he must appear before Caesar, and that he and all sailing with him were to be saved. God having spoken Paul could speak with authority and the utmost assurance. After a fortnight's tossing on the wild seas the feeling of one and all must have been deplorable and depressing. But what had feelings to do with the matter? God had spoken, and Paul's attitude was, I believe God, in spite of all the feelings in the world. All the probabilities of the situation also would have given a negative to what the angel had said. That a small sailing vessel, packed with 276 people, should be wrecked and destroyed, in days when there were no friendly lifeboats, and yet every one of the 276 be saved, was so highly improbable as to be pronounced impossible. But God had said it, so Paul laughed at the impossibility and said, It shall be done. Moreover so strong was his faith that not only did he say this in his heart but he also said it aloud in the way of testimony to the other 275 people on board. His exact words were, It shall be even as it was told me. The salvation of all had not yet happened, but he was as sure of it as if it had. Faith has very simply been defined as believing what God says, because God says it, and this is well supported by Paul's words, I believe God. In this case feelings, reason, experience, the probabilities of the situation, all would have contradicted the divine statement, but faith accepted what God said, though all else denied it. Faith in our hearts will speak in just the same way. The divine testimony to us deals with matters far greater than a salvation for time only, and it reaches us not from the mouth of an angel but through the holy and inspired writings, which we now have in print in our own tongue, but our reception of it is to be equally definite. We simply believe God, 
and thus set to our seal that God is true. Verses 34-36 show us that Paul's attitude and actions corroborated his brave words of faith. Thus we see him exemplifying what James so stresses in his epistle, faith, if it is alive, must express itself in works. If, having uttered words of faith, he had remained depressed and dejected like the rest, no one would have paid much attention to his words. But rather, having announced words of good cheer, he was himself most evidently of good cheer. He gave thanks to God, he partook of food, and exhorted the others to do the same. His works thus attesting the reality of his faith, all were impressed by it. They too were of good cheer and took food. As yet the circumstances were not altered, but they were altered as the confidence of faith found a place in their hearts, for it furnished them with the substantiating of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, Hebrews 11 verse 1. N. Trans. The whole episode is an excellent illustration of what faith is and how faith works. It illustrates also how faith is vindicated. God was as good as his word, and every soul was saved. His promise was fulfilled literally and exactly, and not approximately and with tolerable accuracy, as is so common amongst men. We may take him at his word with absolute certainty. Yet this does not mean that we can become fatalistic and ignore ordinary measures of prudence. This also is illustrated in our story. After Paul had announced that all should be saved, he did not permit the sailors to flee out of the ship, since their presence was needed, and later, when all had eaten enough, they lightened the ship still further by casting the wheat into the sea. They did not fold their arms and do nothing as fatalism would have decreed, but took the ordinary measures of prudence, while trusting in God's word. The ending was really miraculous. In one way or another all were saved.